ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain. I can't hear you. Aye, aye, Captain. Oh. Are we recording? Uh, we are now. I'm going to jump right into it. Cool. Welcome to the Movie Overload Podcast, where we will be covering, discussing... 100 essential films from A Trip to the Moon to Parasite and everything in between, except for Woody Allen. And it should also be noted Roman Polanski, and it should also be noted fuck them. Fuck wow. them both. Except don't. Wow. Also, my name is Hananana. Hello, hello. Oh. Uh, I'm that bird. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of anything. Bear. Good job. The hunter, I guess. Hunter in the corner. Mm-hmm. You're not even in the corner anymore. Like, <laughs> just off center, You're just kind of weird. Creeping closer and closer in every week. <laughs> you guys are closer to corners than I am. That's true. Yeah, and we I'm are getting in farther and farther into it. The closer and closer you get. Remember when you were an elf? No. <laughs> You're like Jingleberry Bob or something. That, oh, he, he he was a unique character. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it was not me. Yeah, that's true. true. They were both on the episode. Okay. To be yeah. fair. True. Oh, you're right. You're right. I mean, granted, I, when I listened back, we were not there at the same time, so I could see how. One might theorize that you didn't talk the same over person. each other, sure, oh but that's because both neither of you guys tend to do that kind of thing. Sure. You're both very respectful, I guess. So. Yeah, yeah, nice exactly. people. And you know, I had to go pee. Right, that's true. I had to go. Oh yeah, you know, and that's so. Yeah, that's a good point. I can neither confirm nor deny. I guess is what I'm saying. You know, there yes. is there is room to convince oneself that I and Dingleberry Bob were the same person. Anyway, I don't mind. Anywho, anywho. anywho. Any, what are we? What are we doing today? What day is it? Well, it is, you know, it is a day. It's it's January. I mean, it's February. It's definitely March. Um, <laughs> we're totally. I mean, again, it's it's whatever time it is that you're listening to it. Yikes! Um, but here we are, folks. We're finally doing it. Here we is. I, me, that bird, that bird, have the privilege today of presenting one of my favorite films by one of my favorite directors of all time. This film has been called the greatest masterpiece in the history of Japanese cinema, the greatest film in the history of cinema as a whole, the film that exemplifies the truest nature of the medium, one of the greatest action films of all time, and one of the most important Jidaigeki films ever made. Is any of this hyperbolic? If you ask film critics, no. If you ask me, no. If you ask someone who doesn't like long films, then probably yes, but that's beside the point. (laughs) Because today we're covering, coming in at 207 minutes, Akira Kurosawa's 1954 classic film, Shinshin no Samurai, Seven Samurai. I'm excited. Imagine not liking long movies. Ah, I have no idea what that would be like. I actually, that made me think though. (laughs) I feel called Um, out. (laughs) Okay, so like, I like, I think, you know, a good long movie is a real good time. But also it's been fun with the like handful of film people that I follow on Twitter, seeing that apparently the Zack Snyder Justice League deal is coming out in March, which, you know, Uh it's four hours and everyone (laughs) of them just basically just being tired and like rubbing their eyes kind of reaction and just being like, oh my God. We have to deal with this again. <laughs> no. I'm going to watch it. I'm not going to be happy about it. I'm going to watch it. And I'm, I'll am i be honest. Like, it's, it might be the thing that I turn off. It's if, if it's, yeah. you know, if I'm getting, you know, an hour and a half in and it's sure. like, oh, this is like the other one. We got to just watch it together and, and poke fun at it. Yeah. We can like, make a day of it. I feel it. like my morbid curiosity will hopefully pull me through it just so I can say I watched it. And, and if it ends up it. somehow actually being good, which for some reason there's a piece of me that thinks it will be, just Maybe. because I kind of am a decent fan of DC it, at this point. It's a low bar. Even though I don't like Zack Snyder, right. I'd like him more than Joss Whedon. Yeah. It's a, and it makes me want to believe that he can pull off something that he can't. Maybe. I feel like this is fast. I feel like hmm. it wasn't that long ago that they were like, okay, I guess it's happening. Anyway, sorry not to derail this it's completely. Gonna, but it, it'll probably stick. I, 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 yeah, that was on my mind. Oh. Maybe, pros are derailing. maybe uh, a few episodes down the line, I will have something to say about it. It won't be timely because reasons. Because you're not uh, time- timey. I just, you know, I'll just forget for a couple months and then right. bring it up. Yeah. Um, or a couple weeks. A couple weeks. Yeah. Or a couple months. I don't, I don't I even don't know. know. I don't know things. Depends. I guess it depends on your brain. Anyway, tell, tell me more about this so fucking sa- samurai. This tell me more changes. about this is it, is fucking nerdy is thing the, that you're into. Is it the anime one? It's the anime is one. Is it the western uh-huh. one? It's, it's the Magnificent Seven. Whoa. Um, There's like no. five of those. I'm, I feel like I after our, <laughs> our last... What? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's my, that's my mood today. I'm just like... Rah. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Well, it's weird because that makes it your mood all of the time whenever <gasps> anybody's listening to it. Oh, you're right. You're right. So that I just makes it your personality, honestly. It is my personality. Um, I, I feel like I want to talk about this movie sort of contrasting it with Tokyo Story because, mm-hmm. I mean, it's for me, it's a new way to look at the film, but also for you guys, it's probably a more, like, easy comparison to make based off of it, but not only being the last thing that we watched for the podcast, but also one of the only other films from this era in Japan that you guys have seen, maybe? Um, yes. So I tried to think about that a lot. Um, so so in stark contrast to Ozu's sparse, minimalist Tokyo story, Seven Samurai is chock full of just about every storytelling and filmmaking technique in the book. 
While Tokyo Story uses its considerable runtime to cause one to sit in the experience of a select few characters, Seven Samurai fills its three and a half hours with a vast variety of subplots and subgenres, never leaving the audience alone for a second. Seven Samurai features everything from a romance and coming of age to, to physical comedy, drama, brutal action. However, the grand scale of the film, which is the reason why I love it, the grand scale of the film is careful not to overshadow the smaller things, like a man fighting against the position of his birth, a teenager learning unexpected lessons in bravery and honor from newfound role models, a controlling father and his daughter's pursuit of an ill-fated romance, a husband seeking vengeance for the wife who was taken from him, and the samurai who, lists, who risk life and limb for a village only to be forgotten in the aftermath of victory and loss. Seven Samurai may be a samurai film, but at its core, it's a story about people, noble and weak, and the heights and depths that they reach in the hands of a world that is anything but just. Like Tokyo Story, Seven Samurai is a film that urges us to be better, to consider others and have empathy. It just happens to do that while being incredibly entertaining and more than a little bit awesome. That Okay, that's my abstract. I, I like uh, yeah. Um, Agreed. I agree with the, uh, those things. <laughs> I second the motion. <laughs> I, I'm curious how you guys felt about that. Like, did, did the more like personal stories and the subplots and whatever feel like they had relevance or some emotional weight with them, maybe in comparison? Mm, yeah. I definitely liked it better than Tokyo Story. I still kind of struggled to get through it. That's fair. It was really long, and I kind of <laughs> broke it up because it was really long. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's at the very least, it I can be a, a two-session movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm a pansy, and I don't like watching long movies. Mm-hmm. So I think I was kind of, like, in and out of it. So, I, like, I did that to myself, though. Like, I broke yeah. it up. Mm-hmm. But, yes, I agree with what you're saying. Cool. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know if I even have much to add at, at this point. I know. But, yeah, I mean, like, all the smaller, yeah, character bits are, like, they're good. They don't get lost. They're like they have, they feel small. Like there's not a lot of mm-hmm. time given to each of those individually, but they're given enough, like time in your mind, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like, um, like with um, his wife being, you know, missing. Like there are hints that something is off about him and a potential wife situation from <laughs> from pretty early on. And you from just like never, the first scene of the yeah, movie, like you never yeah. find out what it is until they go to that camp or whatever mm-hmm. and then you know and then it's like oh no so but like it does it didn't detract from anything else that was happening at the time so yeah it's all very it's all very skillfully done it's like it i don't know it feels like it's a whole world instead of just like one narrow story mm-hmm. um which is cool uh in that sense it's also fun for me who's like really into kurosawa and it has like most of the actors that he works <laughs> with all the time and it, like also like yeah. tatsuya nakada has like a very small like cameo role as like one of the samurai that are like really? walking past and huh like, just weird stuff like that? Of course he does. That's like, I, I don't remember if that's where he got his start or he'd already been working, I think he'd already been working on the human condition with Kobayashi at that mm. point. Mm. Um, but, like, it's weird, you know? Uh, when you go on the Tatsuya Nakadai's page on Letterboxd, this is the top movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really funny, because yeah. every time I look oh. for him, and I, I think I've seen him, I think I caught it, but, like, he's not very recognizable yeah. in that scene. It's always weird, like, having an actor that I like and then going to their letterbox page and seeing that their most popular movie is, like, granted a very popular movie but also it's the one that they had like the least amount of thing yeah. to do in and it's just like, i'd love to be able to sort by like screen time yeah. like yeah. like what is the movie that you're in the most you know be a hard stat to quantify it would be very i mean it's let's be honest it's probably something that will exist in like several years if you could automate it yeah it wouldn't be yeah too bad, yeah but but at the moment crap. it seems like it would be a lot of work you have to do it all by hand i assume yeah which would be people would do it but it would be obnoxious Okay, so I'll do I'm the plot. obnoxious. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not that obnoxious. That's the extent of my contribution. Thank obnoxious. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. So oh, I plan you. on doing a plot summary. Sure. It's a brief yeah. plot summary because it's a long right. movie. could be a long one, but I just made it very fast. It's okay. I mean, I feel like it's kind of a simple movie. That's true. It, it kind of goes more or less the way you think it's going to go. Yeah. But there is a lot of the added depth and complexity, as you mentioned. But when there's all the other sub-themes and whatever. Like, I basically, with the plot, I was like, here's basically what happens. Mm -hmm. I'm not going into subplots or, or, you know, whatever, um, because that would make it too complicated. And then I want to talk a little bit, not too much, about just, like, Kurosawa and, like, sort of his legacy. um, To then go into maybe a little bit more historical context on the samurai film. Um, And then I have, you know, the normal, like, some some anecdotes here about the creation of the film that are fun. Sounds good. Dope. Um, So, you know... Hopefully a, a relatively short report if I'm skipping over, <laughs> you know, how flowery my writing is sometimes. Because I was very into it when I was writing it. <laughs> okay, so I opened the plot summary with the, the opening title cards from the movie. Which I thought was like, I don't know. I just think mm-hmm. it's cool because it's like, man, even Lucas even was like into that stuff. Like true. all of these elements. But um, 
During the civil wars, an endless cycle of conflict left the countryside overrun by bandits. Peaceable folk lived in terror of the thunder of approaching hooves. Aware of an impending raid by a heinous group of bandits, several men of a small farming village make the trek to a larger town in search of samurai to hire to fight off the bandit horde, equipped only with rice as payment. After several unsuccessful attempts to convince a single samurai to help, the farmers come across an old ronin named Kambe, a samurai who has fought many battles, though only on the losing side. They watch him shave his head like a monk in order to save a small child held hostage by a crazed thief, something that would have been quite taboo for samurai to do, um, to, to cut off his hair. Mm. Um, Kambe agrees to help them in their cause and quickly proves himself to be instrumental in recruiting, recruiting others, bringing aboard, uh, ah, bringing aboard the intelligent and good-tempered Gorobe, young and idealistic Katsushiro, stalwart old friend Shichiroji, the master swordsman Kyozu, and the humorous and hot Heihachi. <laughs> and also Kikuchio, the loud and rambunctious man, insisting that he was, has samurai lineage, which Heck. is quickly disproven. Heck yeah. <laughs> With these more or less seven samurai, the farmers return home to prepare for the war that is to come. They arrive back uh, to find a seemingly empty village, which soon becomes apparent is the result of fear-mongering about the samurai taking the farmer's daughters. Scolded into their senses by Kikuchio, the farmers agree to... Uh, the farmers get to work preparing, crafting bamboo spears, and fortifying the village. Kambe's planning and leadership results in a militarized village, complete with trained, if green, squads of soldiers, walls, and moats, and a well-rehearsed strategy for wiping out the ransacking horde. A small group from the village opts to raid the bandit hideout before the true fighting begins, resulting in many bandit casualties and the death of fan favorite Heihachi. I love Heihachi. <laughs> Heihachi's on screen for like 30 seconds. No, he's not. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's making Hunter's all the jokes. Facts he's over a, here. What? He's making the jokes. He's the one chopping the wood. He's the one who makes the flag. I remember him chopping wood, and then I remember him dying. No, I wasn't he attention. makes jokes Spoiler! all the time, Shoot. and it's always funny. Shoot me uh, with a musket. He's my favorite, and he was one my favorite. Three. Shoot one of three. me with a musket. Um. Well, just <laughs> kill me with a throwing star. Nibble my giblets. I was trying to be topical. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, keep going. <laughs> in honor of his sacrifice, Kikuchio flies Heihachi's flag from the tallest building in the village. Then comes the war. Over the course of several days, the village manages to hold their strategy, defending their land and picking off the bandits one by one. And this all comes crashing down when Kikuchio abandons his post in order to steal a rifle from the bandits in a desperate attempt for glory. With bandits attacking from multiple points and the rain coming down harder and harder, the fighting devolves slowly and surely, and the casualties start to stack up for the good guys as well as the bad. Finally, the last few remaining bandits breach the city and are finished off, though Gorobe, Kyozu, and Kikuchio all meet their ends. With the fighting finally over, the farmers start their harvest season in celebration, though for the remaining three samurai, their victory is still at loss as the glory and jubilation go to the farmers, where all the samurai have left to them is the graves of four noble and sacrificial ronin. The end. Sad. The music is good. I don't know why, but that's what I thought of when I said the end. I heard the music. And it was good and stuff, but also apparently the main samurai theme that, like, if you've watched Isle of Dogs, you've heard before because it's the thing that, uh, um, oh man, what's the main character of Isle of Dogs? Anyway, the the, the, the kid, dog, the dog the kid, or the boy, the kid, uh, Atari. Yeah. So he has this little like, you know, he he turns on the music and like stands in front of the dogs looking menacing, uh, yeah. and they just have to stand there and he's like <laughs> frowning at them. And it's it's the theme, it's the samurai nice. theme, theme from Seven Samurai, nice. which apparently was going to be thrown away, or it, like it is actually something that the composer had in the garbage can. He was playing music for <laughs> Kurosawa that he had written in. Kurosawa was like, no, 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 no. And he goes down this long line of stuff and he's like, ah, and in a panic, he like pulls out the thing he just thrown away. And Kurosawa's like, that one. <laughs> uh, and it's one of the most well-known themes um, in classic films um, and definitely in Japanese cinema. So that's fun. Anyway, music good. Um, but like, okay, Kurosawa as a dude, um, he's interesting because, you know, even if you're not super into movies, you've probably heard of him. You've probably heard him mentioned before. He's definitely the most successful Japanese director um, worldwide of all time, um, to the extent that I was, I was reading his autobiography yesterday, and the preface was like, essentially, whether or not people are a big fan of him in Japan, like, depending on the, you know, indie director in Japan or whatever, everybody, like, kind of gives credit to the fact that they're able to make movies because of Kurosawa, because he actually broke out of the Japanese market enough mm -hmm. that they people have a market for their movies now. Yeah. Um, so he's, like, such a big figure um, for Japanese cinema that, like, he makes, you know, someone like Spielberg feel like just kind of another guy, like, as far as cultural <laughs> impact, um, which is crazy. Um, but he also had a very... He was also very, like, um, despite this importance during his career, you know, he was also pretty humble about his thoughts on film. Like, he, he wanted Final Cut and whatever, but he, I mean, he wasn't pretentious. Like, his, mm -hmm. like a, a good quote from him is just, a truly good movie is interesting and easy to understand. <laughs> he was, 
He said, I often say this, but cinema is like a public square where people of the world gather. On the screen, we see people living in different parts of the world, and we share the full spectrum of their emotions and come to understand them. When we see them happy, we're happy. When they suffer, we suffer too. So I say cinema is a system that can inspire people of the world to get along. I don't know. Like, he, he has a very, like, I don't know. I, I don't know what the word is. Some sort of childlike innocence in an approach to film. of just like, this is just a thing. This is fun. This is entertaining. Mm-hmm. And it can inspire people to get along, but it's not like what I'm doing is, like, he didn't view himself as like a true artist. This is the peak of everything. <laughs> he, yeah. you know, he he wasn't incredibly. He didn't think he was the Michelangelo of cinema or something, and he wasn't trying to communicate some like higher, whatever. Right. Um, he was just trying to explain kind of his. You know, this is this is what I make. This I is just, I just like a movie. I, yeah. <laughs> well, the 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 introduction to his autobiography is just like so. I didn't want to make uh, an autobiography because I felt like it would just be movies. He's like, in other words, you take me and you subtract you subtract movies and the answer is zero. <laughs> and he's like, so I didn't want to just rant about movies. <laughs> um, but then I read Jean Renoir's autobiography and I had conversations with him and he seemed not like the kind of person who would write an autobiography who was super into himself and whatever. And so when I read his, I was like, okay, maybe this is something I could do. And then he only wrote about his like childhood. He like didn't go into his, most of his movie career, like when he got successful. Huh. It's mm. it interesting. I don't know. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, he, Weird. He got a decent amount of recognition um, in his later life, um, but he, I don't know, he still, even like in the 90s when he'd finished all of his movies and whatever, and been considered, you know, one of the greatest directors he'd ever lived, he didn't have the like, you know, he still just didn't think about of himself as somebody who really got what he was doing. Um, like he, he, he got an award later in life and his quote is just, I'm very deeply honored to receive such a wonderful surprise, but I have to ask whether I really deserve it. I'm a little worried because I don't feel that I understand cinema yet. I really don't feel that I've grasped the essence of cinema. Cinema is a marvelous thing, but to grasp its true essence is very, very difficult. But what I promise you is that from now on, I will work as hard as I can at making movies, and maybe by following this path, I will achieve an understanding of the true essence of cinema and earn this award. Um, That award was a Lifetime Achievement Award presented to him at the Oscars in 1990 by Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And he gets up there, he's like, I don't know, guys. Wow. I don't know if I deserve it. I don't know. I mean, oh, maybe next year. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, though. I feel like that's kind of a thing, though, between a lot of like people who are like really good at what they do. Mm-hmm. Like, they're all just also the people who are like, man, this is this is hard. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But it's like, no, but you're like you're great at it. Like everybody looks up to you, and they're like, why? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's very inspiring. It's, you know, instead of someone who's like, oh yeah, I got it down. This is easy, and then they make crap. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he's not, um, whatever that guy, Todd, uh, is it Todd Phillips? Yeah, it? yeah. I, maybe, yeah, I don't really know what his attitude is. I don't know, he was on the director's round table that, like, the Hollywood Reporter or whatever did the, you know, yeah. have you seen this? I love I remember seeing He's on there with, like, yeah. Martin Scorsese and, like, Greta Gerwig and people, and he's, like, interjecting a lot, and it's like, you don't, dude. sorry, like, dude. not in, like, a mean way or pretentious way, you don't belong here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, saw, go saw back saw to making it. Hangover movies. Yeah. You I don't saw, belong here. I saw a thread of just, like, here's a bunch of directors post thoughts about them or whatever I was dumb but like one of them was him <laughs> and people just kept replying to it being just like dogging on him and one was just like biggest waste of a best director nomination and I was just like yeah, yeah. yeah because yikes. it could have gone to Greta fucking Gerwig <laughs> I don't know why she didn't get it uh Nobody sexism does. yeah um oh. yeah like he'll get nominated for best movie and best screenplay or whatever it was but not best director we're gonna throw that off over uh, here despite the fact that it is probably probably the like other than parasite like the biggest directorial feat of the year literally probably. like there's a lot of movies that i like more maybe like there's a few but i don't know i, f- I feel like she kind of deserved that one maybe even over Pong. um did you see the greta gerwig nonsense happening on twitter yesterday no it was really funny because i don't know if it was yesterday or maybe a couple days ago but somebody made a very dumb tweet and i don't even know if it was anything in the article but like it was an article being like hollywood don't like uh, take the, it might have been something about like protests or something. I can't remember if it was more to do about January 6th or something or something else. It was probably something else. Maybe like the other stuff. I don't know. Something, you know, something a lot and something heavy and important. And they're like, don't take that and make it about like, a, 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 he's like, dear Greta Gerwig, don't make that <laughs> real life story about like, you know, a boy and a girl who are each on like different sides and have to come together anyway. Like just the most like, off base like weird thing like they're like you can express that sentiment but like why her yeah (laughs) like you know Greta Gerwig and her weird historical thriller films like (laughs) what are you talking about it's not her (laughs) shtick I don't know honestly it's like I don't know if it's something like 
I don't, I don't, who would do that? Like, <laughs> some weirdo. I mean, if Richard Attenborough was still around, that would be something he would do. In sure. income poop? And then Kaboop. Eh, um, and then Kaboop. Anyway, it was, it was funny. And everyone was just laughing at him. Whoever wrote that tweet for just being yeah. like, come on, eh. that, that makes no sense. Anyway. Did you see the more so exciting Greta Gerwig news? No. Uh, so, no Bombeck has released a little bit of information about his new picture. <gasps> oh! And you know who the leads are? Uh, him. Greta Gerwig and Adam Driver. <laughs> what? Uh, I, I, it's my dream. Thanks. <laughs> it's my dream movie. Guess what? Okay, Adam Driver is like... How is he as productive as he is? Because he's got like five movies upcoming, I feel like. Well, yeah, but that's because a lot of them got pushed back. True. But like, and, and things like that we're supposed to think be in 2020. <sighs> some of them, yeah. I saw a casting on breakdowns for an Adam Driver movie. They were mm. looking for a kid. Anyway, yeah. I wanted to throw in this yes. interesting side plug yeah. that's completely off topic, but I know yeah. someone who was auditioning for a big role in The Whale, which is the next big A24 film. Oh, yeah. Oh, snap. It's also based off of uh, a Samuel D. Hunter play, which I used to read a lot in my mm. classes. I didn't know that. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Cool. That's cool. Famous. Cool, cool, That's cool, rad. Cool. I like all those things. I like. I think they're predicting that that one might get uh, some uh, Academy Award nominations. Already. Oh, I mean, like they know yeah. which films are going to be in the game for the Oscars. So, yeah. That's cool. Go Don't off. That. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to see that one. That's fun. Or the Oscars will snub them because you know. Ooh, true. You know, apparently, snub Greta Gerwig, but it's fine. Uh -huh. You know who Who's did get that whale? nomination? I don't know. Who's directing the whale? I don't know. I don't know nothing about no whale. Oh, I guess it's like their big thing. It's supposed to be a big deal. I mean, A24 has a few of those a year generally. Right. Um, I'll find out. Keep going. You know who Tell did who get got a, that a, nomination? A, uh, Scorsese got a nomination that year, uh, and you know what he had to say about Kurosawa? He said the term "giant" is used too often to describe artists, but in the case of Akira Kurosawa, we have one of the rare instances in which the term fits. I also have a bunch of quotes from like Inaratu and Coppola and people calling him the Shakespeare of cinema, and all the other stuff. Um, but you know, basically, good guy. He people like him as a director, but also people like him as a person. Thank you. <laughs> Even though he was very, like, seemingly prone to anger and frustration and was very perfectionist on screen, um, he would often make people redo multiple tasks to, to get them exactly right. Um, and he did not compromise on pretty much anything. Uh, he was a bit of a dictator and auteur, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but he was also, something I found interesting, he was rather performative as a director, playing up his frustration and making a bit of a show at yelling at his assistant, uh, assistant directors in order to make other parts of his crew work harder. Hmm. And he would make it up to them later by, like, buying them drinks and whatever. <laughs> like, he seemed like a, a, a nice guy, um, but, like, he was sort of, at least from what I've read, like, yeah, kind of this, like, acting as the, the dictator because this mm -hmm. is how he had control on his set. Yeah. Hmm. Um, interesting. Despite his apparent constant scoldings on set, it seems nearly everyone who worked on his sets had a favorable opinion of him, believing him to be kind and such. Um, so that's really interesting. Because, like, you know, you hear stories about, like, Hitchcock or whatever being, like, just complete assholes yeah. and just being disgusting and whatever. And mm -hmm. Kurosawa, at the very least, like, there's a lot you could say, you know, about the way that, you know, those those shots of, um, what's her name? Um, the, the daughter. The only um, girl in the movie? Yes. Yeah, her. <laughs> um, but, like, he, he would have these, like, mirrors placed up to, like, get the lighting exactly right in her, in her eyes. And they had to, like, redo it so many times and get the light brighter and brighter Jeez. as they're doing it. Then, like, her, she was, like, <laughs> you know, had, like, eye problems. I don't think oh for, like, gosh. long after, but her eyes were just, like, burning mm -hmm. doing that scene. And, like, he, you know, he'd, he'd do stuff like that. Like, he just had yeah. to get it exactly right. Um, hmm. But apparently, on, on all grounds, he was, he was pretty cool. And, uh, hey, at the very least, he was definitely not misogynistic. I mean, especially for the time, but, like, in general, he's not misogynistic in the same way that someone like Hitchcock would be. Good job. Um, his, uh, like, like a lot of the very close personal friends that he's made over the years that he worked with on like every film mm -hmm. were females. He was very open to collaborating and giving room to like female assistant directors and mm -hmm. script girls and et cetera. Um, which is, which is rad for, you know, 1940 in Japan, but also like he's made some like all female cast movies. He's, he's done a lot of very interesting and somewhat progressive things. Although I would say, his all-female lead movie was definitely uh, imperialist propaganda from the World War II area and, and does have some very problematic things, both mm. with how the way it deals with females and imperialism in general, but it's mm. it's propaganda. I don't think it is reflective of his views. Yeah. Anyway, he's, he's a cool dude, I guess is my point, to just begin with. He's cool. Um, but if we want to go a bit more into like the actual context of, I think when he's making the film is interesting. Um, basically, the two things you need to know, there, there's, there's one distinction in Japanese cinema at this time. Um, essentially, is it's is it a Jidai Geki or a Gendai Geki film? Um, What's that mean? The Jidai Geki are the period films. Yeah, Gendai Geki are modern films. I am. Ah! I'm, I'm not oh. yet. I'm getting there. Um, Sorry, I'm just here to make dinosaur noises. <laughs> and that's what we need. Okay, good. That's what we need. <laughs> that's in this, all I'm this. good at anymore. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Keep going, I'm sorry. Uh, no, uh, you're good. So uh. you would see normally, like obviously Ozu's film, Tokyo Story, is Gendai Geki. That's most of what Ozu made was mm-hmm. was these like these modern contemporary films that are very obviously dealing with, more dramatic, and dealing with modern problems to an extent. Um, mm-hmm. But the Jidai Geki were more the, you know, usually more entertaining action-based films, or sometimes, sometimes they were more like trying to make a film adaptation of like a historical event like the 47 Ronin. There's usually mm-hmm. like, an adaptation of that movie like every year um Jeez. but they weren't always super period accurate they were usually like trying to kind of play up the entertainment value as opposed to saying anything mm. um and samurai films was not so much considered a genre as it was just a focus of a lot of jidai geki films if mm. that makes sense so it wasn't like the samurai film the whatever it was period or modern um mm. but kurosawa did like there was a bit of a movement to to bring in relevant moral messages into Jidai Geki films, um, especially starting in the 30s from, like, Mizuguchi and Okamoto and a lot of other people. Um, but Kurosawa, like, definitely popularized it. Mm-hmm. He wanted to not only make a film that had a moral message or, or the ability to deliver a moral message, but he also wanted to make a movie that... Um, he wanted to make a film that, like, had some amount of period accuracy. So he's like, I'm making a period film. I want to make a film that actually makes sense and, and it actually shows what life would have been like. Mm. Like, his first concept of the film was completely different. It was just a samurai. He wakes up in the morning. He goes, he prays at the temple. He, he goes to work, working for, a, you know, a daimyo. And then he fails and comes home and commits ritual suicide. And that's the end of the movie. Oh. And they could not find enough, like, historical research or whatever to show the daily life of an employed samurai in that period. <laughs> so he didn't make it. And so they went through a few different iterations of trying to make something that was, you know maybe entertaining, but but a realistic depiction of things. And sort of by coincidence, they ran into this information of, there are actually some samurai that would be employed by farmers to fight mm. off bandits. And he was like, that's what we're doing. <laughs> There's going to be seven samurai. And this is in, and then they got to work. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it came out of this, like, trying to bring back, also, an important note about the American occupation is when Japan lost the war, America occupied Japan. They began censoring yeah. films that had nationalistic flares, evoked feudalism, or even collectivism. Um, so very quickly, the Jidai Geki film and the Samurai film along with it were almost entirely killed off by American censors. Um, for example, the retellings of the 47 Ronin were banned. Uh, most of the depictions of old Japan were, were banned and not able to be made. Um, so so once, the, uh, once, the, once the ball got rolling again after the American occupation ended, he kind of brought back the Samurai film, but in this new like period-accurate way. Nice. Uh, a lot of his films, actually kind of all of his films, except for maybe Rashomon, um, up to this point, were Gendai Geki modern films. Mm. Um, so this is like the first real like samurai samurai film. Yeah. Um, and it's and definitely the first one with like a, you know, realistic flair right. to it. Um, mm. Which I, which makes it for me a heck of a lot more interesting as not just this like another movie in a long line of samurai films or something like that. And this one just happens to be really big. It's like mm. it has a completely different approach to the way that it's being made mm-hmm. that had a massive impact not only obviously on American cinema, but on. Japanese cinema as a whole. It, just, it changed the Jidai Geki um, <laughs> in a pretty dramatic way. Um, but it, but there are elements to it that aren't realistic um, that he's, in, in which he's, he's trying to promote his like sort of modern ideas. <laughs> um, like he's, he's criticizing elements of westernization. He's opting for collectivism and all that kind of stuff <laughs> over individualism. Um, but he also likes democracy, right? He wants to keep that idea. He's not really <laughs> opting for feudalism or imperialism um, and so that kind of comes through it in ways that like wouldn't have been around at the time, um, with the way that people talk and the way people are, consider other people's emotions to an extent. Um, there's, there's a lot of this that's like, yeah, sure. We need to keep, you know, we need to keep the, the, the ideas of honor and loyalty and all these things that the samurai embodied, but we also need to move on in a, in a democratic way where your, your loyalty isn't to one's Lord, it's to the people and mm-hmm. your honor isn't, you know, protecting your daimyo. It's, it's, uh, doing like kind of what's right by people. Um, That's cool. So he did a, a few different things in that sense that are really interesting. And if we had more time, I would probably dive into a lot more of the historical context of the period that, that existed in, because the, the more you dig into the historical period, the more interesting it, it gets um, for me. <laughs> but, but yeah, that essential idea is um, just kind of Kurosawa being like, the samurai, he, here is the best of humanity, uh, us overcoming our flaws in order to protect the innocent and taking up this responsibility, this duty. There's honor, um, and then kind of calling out the uh, the farmers, in a sense, of being like, don't just act out of expediency and and just kind of do let your life remain unchanged. I guess mm-hmm. by by these concepts, like the villagers, 
Um, but let the example of the samurai, the sacrifices mean something to you. Do not simply move on unaffected. The crisis averted. Um, the crisis of, of what you do with your own actions be who you can become um, is what it feels like that film is saying, um, which is very interesting. Uh, it's, yeah, he's, he's, he's changing the Jidai Geki, but he's also changing the idea of samurai themselves through the film by just putting it in a new context of like, guess what? Actual loyalty and honor and being a decent person has nothing to do with the rich person that owns you, <laughs> yeah. um, which is cool. So it's, it's weird because he's, he's fighting against some ideas of like the progressivism of the, of individualism and whatever, and retaining a lot of the, um, like traditional values, mm -hmm. but he's also moving forward in like a humanistic way. So he, he's, he's neither conservative nor progressive. Yeah, that uh, works. Which, I like it. Yeah, is cool. Um, yeah, anyway, so that, that, was, that was my thought about the themes of the film. Um, I don't know if any of that like came across directly in the film or if it took more uh, historical context. I mean, the context adds to it, makes yeah. it more meaningful, but like, it's not hard, I feel like, to pick up on the, the collectivism, at least. Like, there's a few very straightforward spots and lines of just being like, no, I can't remember the specific phrasing, but yeah, basically being like, if you, you know, fight alone, you die alone. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But like you've got to you know come at this as a whole as a group and that's how you that's how we win right mm -hmm. yeah which you know applies to more than just that immediate scenario right, right. yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's it's interesting because it's you know at the same time it it has these very interesting for me like philosophical themes um, that that mm -hmm. had a big effect on you know where the country was going and it had things to say and whatever um, but it also doesn't come across as preachy in any way mm -hmm. like he's not being like here, watch this, and you cannot help but feel the exact point that I'm trying right. to get across. He's yeah. not preachy in any way, yeah. which I think is like, another reason why he's as big as he is. You can just take all that as it's just the movie. Right. It's like, yeah, it makes sense in that scenario, and it's fine. Mm -hmm. But then if you just, you know, you can extrapolate that those ideologies into something. Right. You know, mm -hmm. Applicable to life. Which huh. is cool. Um, I don't know. I'm just really appreciative of artists who, like, have something to say but don't feel like having something to say is more important than like what the audience is coming in expecting or even mm -hmm. just like how they're saying it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like you can say something important, but if you say something important in a way that nobody can connect to, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Um, and realizing people come in to be able to see another perspective on life. Like people are entering a movie to, to feel what someone else is feeling and to be entertained. Making that the primary goal mm -hmm. is fine. Um, and it's another reason why I think I like Kurosawa as opposed to like, a lot of other, you know, big name directors because he's not, it, it's, there's definitely more um, understanding of the medium in the sense of people come here to be entertained. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I can say something interesting and yeah, I can reach excellence and treat this as an art and all these things, but but people are still coming to be entertained, yeah, not to be time. wowed at my brain and not for <laughs> me to yeah. be Woody Allen and jack myself off. Sorry. Strikes a good um, balance. But you know. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. What? Um I know lots of people like him, but like, honestly, why? Is it just because you're also pretentious? Or His is name it, is, is Woody Allen. It's not a, I mean, that, that's basically. That's like your number one red flag. Know. Right. God. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Ugh. Um, yeah. So he, the one film that he did before this that was technically a samurai film, um, didn't actually get released until after the occupation because mm -hmm. it was whatever, but it was based off of a kabuki play, which they're very, you know, dramatized and they're, they're not very realistic at all. So this was obviously his first attempt at doing this sort of thing. Uh, Rashomon also was the thing that, uh, in 1950, is the thing that g got him. I, I, I don't know why I didn't put that in the report, but Rashomon is the reason why he was popular in America. It won the top prize at the Venice Film Festival, and mm -hmm. it, like, actually broke out of the Japanese market. And it was, mm -hmm. it was that film, nice. which is a period film, but it's set in a forest and has a samurai, but, like, mm -hmm. not really. And there's just not a lot to, that the American occupation could, could comment on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, which is how it made it. Mm -hmm. um, so he kind of snuck through with that one. Cool. But this is him like fully coming out and doing it. Um, that Yeah, so the, the first idea of the Harakiri, story, Harakiri ritual suicide story, where he wakes up, shaves his head, prays at the temple, all that stuff, um, didn't work. The second idea was to follow five samurai in a series of epic action sequences. And uh, they wrote it out, and the script was scrapped because it was just a series of dramatic climaxes that didn't function as a film. <laughs> <laughs> so they just it was just attempt after attempt after attempt. And at this point, they'd gotten to like several years longer between films or than he, he was used to. You know, he'd release a film a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last film was 1952, and here they are. Seven Samurai doesn't come out until 54. Yeah. The, like, 
they're they're taking so much more time. And they're like, what's what's going on? Mm-hmm. Um, they finally come up with this idea and they spend um, forty five days in a stay at Atami, uh, which was the place that they sent their the family members off to in mm-hmm. Tokyo Story. They went oh, to yeah. an inn there, and uh, Hideo Ogani and Shinobu Hashimoto and Kurosawa um, are, the, are the three collaborators that did a lot of his bigger films. They spent forty five days there in uh, December of fifty two after Ikiru with the goal of writing a realistic action story with samurai as a th- theme is the, is the quote. Um, nice. And he didn't leave at all during those 45 days. He stayed in that inn and just tried writing and it was driving him like insane. Um, but they just, they, they knocked it all out in that one hit and then just, uh, just went through with it. And at that point, Kurosawa had already come up with the characters of the samurai and had very extreme detailed notes on like the way that they would walk when somebody calls their name, how do, which like way do they kind of turn around and what like what would they normally say in response? Like he had everything down for these seven characters, um, which is cool and probably a useful thing for making um, like a what what, the, what an ensemble picture, I guess, because yeah. just having yeah. distinct characterization between people. Because yeah, that totally is a situation where like if you don't put specific care into that, mm-hmm. you're just gonna have seven copy paste mm-hmm. of the same dude. So like, yeah, Yeah. but I think, yeah, they did a good job of differentiating them all. They are all, for the most part, pretty distinct. The only character for me that doesn't ever stand out is uh, Daisuke Kato's character, Shichiroji, who's um, like Kanbei's old friend that he knew, Mm. who like, is just like, he's like, ah, so this might be the one that finally kills us. Are you going to join us? He's yes. (laughs) And and he's very little screen time. There's definitely a few that, yeah, like, we're almost not characters. Yeah. And, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe you have to, there's seven of them. You kind of have to pick a few to be like, okay. Right, we're getting, you're like a big yeah. character, and you're like you're here too, but like we're not gonna do as much with you. Right, like Kikuchio Kambe, uh, have a lot of screen time for me. Heihachi and Gorobe are interesting too, but I can see a lot of people. I mean, you were like he's not even in there, I, but he is. I didn't for me. realize he, yeah, he specifically more than the others. I mean, a lot of them, yeah, were kind of sometimes got lost. Yeah, I, I would also say Gorobe kind of got lost in the shuffle a lot of the time for me too. But like, yeah, Heihachi, I just like they said his name like two times in the mm-hmm. movie, and I just kind of like forgot. Like there was no. They're still at this point, like, I'm just bad at keeping up with well, he was, he was the, the one time. that was making all the jokes. Who? I don't even know. And then Gorobe was like, ah, oh, he, he'll nothing. be a, he will be, um, what was, what was it? He was like, uh, yeah. I remember the sentiment. In, in, he, he'll be, uh, light and dark times, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And then he, he makes the flag and he's constantly poking fun. He's like the oh. one that's constantly making fun of, uh, Kikuchio, uh, Toshido Mifune's character. Anyway, it's fine. <laughs> they, I think a lot of them have personality yeah. to an extent. Totally. Um, except for Shichiroji. It just it doesn't exist. Like, every time I watch the movie, I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot he was there. Yeah. Um, oh, well. But, you know, I appre- appreciate the, the attempt at, like, and, and it's honestly, as far as ensemble films go, very successful at flushing out yeah. as many of the characters as it does. Because on top of the samurai, there's all of the other supporting characters that you really do get to know. Like, the mm-hmm. amount of screen time that Yohei has um, <laughs> is just great. Like, I don't know. He's a very funny character. Yeah. I love him, and uh, he's in a, a few of Kurosawa's movies, <laughs> and he's my favorite. I love him. Um, yeah so the film was originally intended to start with bandits taking another village and then proceeding on to the one in the picture Mm -hmm. which is why the first line of dialogue in the film is a bandit saying take this village too Mm -hmm. Um, but he removed it because he doesn't like elaborate openings to films which then I thought Mm -hmm. about I was like he would not like the last (laughs) 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 Uh, he wouldn't like the opening Um, the writing process heavily involved the cutthroat dismissal of many of the scenes proposed he made sure the film was trim and succinct as much as he could um Another cutscene ended up actually being filmed where the Master Swordsman Kyozu was shown to be clumsy when helping farmers harvest in the field. <laughs> which that would be funny. It would have been funny, but he was like, I don't know if we need it. They didn't, for sure. So like, it, it would have added would maybe be, a little bit more character to Kyozu. It would just be ironic humor, if, yeah. like, if anything. But like, yeah, which would have been nice. Yeah, he didn't, I don't know, he did a decent amount of stuff, I feel like. Yeah, he yeah. He mostly was just like, I'm here. And, mm-hmm. and I'm good at killing people. <laughs> yeah. Here I, I don't is. talk a lot. Womp, womp. A bit more historical or cultural context would reveal that uh, Kyozu is modeled heavily after one of the most famous uh, samurai of all time, uh, Misashi Miyamoto, hmm. who there is a, a movie series by Hiroshi Inagaki from around this era that actually has Toshido Mifune starring as Musashi Miyamoto. It's, like a, it's a trilogy of three movies, and they're nice. apparently also very good. Um, but he he's like a very big cultural touchstone of like, the samurai. Uh, and so that's who they had Kyozu modeled yeah, after, for gotcha. the most part. Um, yeah. I already said the thing about uh, about the music and uh, Fumio Hayasaka having like to grab stuff out of the trash in order to find good themes and all that. Um, mm-hmm. That Hayasaka was uh, 
pretty constant collab- collaborator with Kurosawa, although this was the last picture he did because he actually died a year after the film's release. Hmm. So he couldn't finish composing Kurosawa's next film, I Live in Fear, which is a movie about uh, Toshiro Mifune being an old man um, who is just absolutely terrified that they're going to get nuked again. <laughs> um, and it's oh. it's a rough time. Um, I think it's a really good movie. I, a lot of people don't... It doesn't seem to get as much talked about as much. Um, but it's a... I don't know. He's basically trying to sell all their family business and move to Brazil hmm. to get them away from... His, his family away from the nukes. And his family's like, what the heck are you doing, bro? <laughs> um, what the heck? Yeah. Hmm. So the, film was, the filming was scheduled for three months, but actually turned into nearly a year. <laughs> it was very, like, there's lots yeah. of film. It went, it went very long. Um, you know, because he's having, he had all these obsessions with, like, making things shot exactly right. And filming outside was just a challenge. And, you know, having, he had an obsession with how eyes appeared in the film, which is why he was doing that thing with the mirrors. Mm. Um, he, they just had to be this focal point. Um, and so he had just mirrors constantly everywhere and pretty much every scene trying to get pe- like the reflection directly in people's eyes to make them show up properly on camera. Um, he's very nitpicky with lighting. And uh, th- I mean, there, there are a few examples of things that were just really challenging to do, like burning down the, me- the mill. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. that the wood awesome, got soggy and would smoke and they had, it, was, <laughs> it worked. It, like they, they really did burn it down, but they had to rebuild the mill three times to get all the shots they needed. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was rough. I wondered about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the bandit hideout fire scene was rough. They had to wait very long because they legally had to have a fire truck on standby, but fire trucks had to be dispatched because of real fires. So they wait for to film the scene until it was nearly dusk. The actors just had to sit there and wait. And then by the time they were finally able to shoot, um, they only had the ability to do it once because the set was so big. And like there's the rock formations behind them were made out of tin and like it's just a big set. Um, Kurosawa had poured gasoline on a lot of the set, meaning that it burned hotter and faster than many of the actors anticipated. Oh my the gosh. actor who paid uh, Rikichi received some minor burns from how hot the air was. But when he had to run into the burning building, uh, Minoru Chiaki, who's Heihachi, um, was not where he needed to be on set to pull Rikichi out. Oh, what? So a, a piece of the word. set had to be set up again to film the part where Heihachi saves Rikichi and gets <laughs> shot. So, um, when Kurosawa was finally able to yell cut at the conclusion of that scene, he reportedly sat alone and cried, oh, <laughs> being relieved that such an intense and challenging scene had wrapped. Oh, um, <laughs> That's kind of funny. It was kind of cute. Um, also, filming the final battle scene was originally going to be like, you know, in a warm time, but the filming took so long that it was like February when they filmed that with all the Ooh. rain. Uh, you know, also the actors' costumes being extremely light with like Mifune's butt yeah. being exposed the entire time. Yeah. Um, and having to like wade through puddles and all this other Jeez. stuff. Kurosawa himself said that he couldn't do a shoot like that again if he was begged to. <laughs> it snowed just before filming the final battle, so they had to water down the snow to be able to shoot. They used seven water trucks to make the set muddy and make it rain. They filmed the final battle across several locations, meaning they were using different horses for different shots. So the set design department had to actually apply makeup to the horses to make them like look like the same horses. Oh my gosh! It was it was insane. It was freezing. It was not a good time for anybody. Mm. Um, but it was aided by the fact that Kurosawa used a multi camera setup to to film things, which was not a thing at the time at all. Yeah. He was like one of the few people that did a multi camera setup. Cool. Um, which is a big reason why the action is more intense and vivid and interesting right. than in other movies from the era because you have a shot of the horse coming by and then it cuts into another shot of the horse continuing to move and then yeah. there's there's several different angles of things happening. Um, and Kurosawa actually was the editor as well for the movie. Oh, so wow. he's the reason why that movie just, and that final bit just like cuts into interesting places and gets underneath the horse's yeah. legs and different bits and just... <laughs> he was a visionary. It's crazy stuff, like especially for the time in which it was made. Yeah. Um, he also opted for less glamorization and more realism in how violence was depicted. You know, mm. a lot of the kabuki play sword fight that they would have in, in earlier Jidaigeki films was like very much like, you know, somebody like basically trying to hit somebody else's sword to make yeah. it look like fencing or all this stuff that just like wouldn't have really been there and, and was just kind of flashy and choreographed. Um, he didn't want that in his films, um, you know, which is why that, that one battle between Kyozu and that other guy just at the opening when they first fi- find him is just like one swipe, Yeah, you know. Um, he's he's trying to make it look like it did, um, but he's also trying to not make it look appealing. Like he's trying to show the fear and the you know whatever yeah. of what's going on. But like that kind of ended up becoming iconic too, mm-hmm. for sure. Oh yeah, like fast, quick fight for sure. It's 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 very cool. Obviously. Um, there is there's basically just nothing like the action in this film during that time in history. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not again yeah, it's not very pretty or gorgeous action, but it's you know. Mm-hmm. It works. It's cool. It, it gets the feeling across. It fits, yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and a lot of people 
have taken the idea of filming a final battle scene like in the rain from him. Mm. Like it like it wasn't really a thing that had been done a lot because it's obviously very challenging to pull yeah. off and whatever. But like you go down, there's like a laundry list if you go into like a Wikipedia article or whatever of just every film that like has directly taken bits from this movie. Specifically, sure. that is like a trope now. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Um, mm. Also, his ability to create contrast between like slow motion and normal speed at different points, mm -hmm. uh, between like periods of like where it's just completely silent and then like very loud, um, aided I think in in creating the the feel of a lot of these moments, mm -hmm. um, because he's he's very aware that like just just bringing it up to like twelve isn't going to do everything. I need to like have it at twelve. If something emotional happens. It's at two. Like you need to you need to be able to to move through this wide range of emotional you know. Yeah stuff with the limited runtime of 207 minutes how do you do it a mirror um they're like damn the editing brings so much more emotion into the film i feel like yeah. um which is cool like uh, he's a very good uh, editor um the film wrapped march 18th 1954 which is weird because it came out in 1954 imagine trying to edit a movie <laughs> like this together in a few months Jeez. i don't know how he did that um it's tough okay one more interesting thing yeah about the production um the sound Apparently, mm. they only had four tracks to work with for the sound of this film. Mm. Which, for reference, we have access to recording five for this podcast, and if we wanted to, we could layer in about 251 more. Probably more than that. Yeah. But we have so many tracks that we have the ability to use on like just my laptop or right. whatever. They only had four tracks that they could That's do stuff insane. with. So they had it split up between dialogue, um, FD, which is this like the overlapping dialogue. So they had two tracks for dialogue. Yeah. And then all of the other sound effects and music and whatever had to be layered in in just two tracks. So they had to repeatedly re-record fully to get timing right and ended up getting mud all over the studio trying to recreate noises and <laughs> trying to combine everything onto tracks was just incredibly huh. challenging. And mm. I don't know. I think the, the sound design guy was talking about it and he was like looking back. I was like, I don't know why we did it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's like, was, was it worth it? it? <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah, it wasn't worth it is what <laughs> I was exactly going to yeah, say. You yeah. got it. I don't know. <laughs> Um, but they were like really specific about it, like to get the horses' nays to oh, be yeah. a bit more dramatic. Oh my they gosh. separated the male and female horses that they had. And then, like, brought the male horses in closer towards the female horses after, like, a lot of time separated. And so the male horses were very horny, I guess. And the female <laughs> horses were in heat. And so the horse noises they used are just very horny male horses. Nice. Like, they just tried to get the most extreme horse noise they could. And they ended up reusing those sounds in, like, a ton of his movies, like, later. Mm -hmm. Because they, it was, apparently it was a good recording session. That's insane. <laughs> but, like, the, like, the effort it'll to, work. Like, yeah, like, to do all of that kind of stuff. Like, being a Foley artist sounds so mm -hmm. weird because, like, you have to even work with animals and yeah. like figure out how to get them to make the sound you want them to yeah. in an ethical way like it's weird oh my gosh but they did it I guess they did it yeah there they were and it's not something that you even really notice when you watch the film like yeah the horses are making the noises you would want them yeah. to yeah probably again that's like something at this point where it's just like yeah that's just what horses in movies sound like right and then you hear the story behind it and you're like oh it's a lot of effort it's maybe yeah. not supposed to sound like that right like they wouldn't they wouldn't sound like that I guess realistically I guess, yeah. maybe um, movies are like that that's how it be I guess um, so Upon release, I have some critical and commercial success stuff. Everyone hated it. Everyone hated it. It's credited with reviving the genre of the samurai film. <laughs> they hated it. a realistic it. and epic way of storytelling. Though at the same time, it's truly the film that brought the samurai film to the West, proving that the Japanese could make exciting action films for two Western audiences. Obviously got remade into The Magnificent Seven. Everybody knows this. Um, his later films got you know remade into Sergio Leone, took a lot of his stuff, like A Fistful of Dollars. Mm. Was, uh, you know, all of it. His stuff, just like samurai film, translated into Western film. Um, so that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and this is the, this is credited as the one that really did that. Um, Seven Samurai is the best-selling title that, uh, the British Film Institute has ever released, apparently. Hmm. Um, it has 100% of Rotten Tomatoes, voted number one on Empire Magazine's Greatest Films of World Cinema, often ranks near the very top of the greatest films ever made. The accolades are nearly endless as far as modern reception goes. The craziest part is that there is no consensus as to whether or not this is actually Kurosawa's best film. Because Rashomon, Ikiru, Ran... Uh, Red Beard, all of these other notable films are just as highly received by audiences and critics alike. Um, like for me, I tried to make a list of like the essential Kurosawa films, and we'll get to it. We're almost there, but like, it's I don't know that this is his masterpiece because he has like seven or eight <laughs> equally comparable masterpieces. Um, masterpiece. So he's also inspired such films as here's just a brief list of films he's inspired. Uh, Three Amigos, The Magnificent Seven, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, The Matrix Revolutions, Mad Max Fury Road, Blade Runner, Mad Max 2, Galaxy Quest, The Avengers, Infinity War, etc. Countless others. Um, but those are the ones that have, like, the most direct correlation to this film. I've seen some um, of those. Seen some he puts the ass in Masterpiece. I want to watch The Road Warrior. I, I bet it's fine. I don't know. I'm not that interested in Mad Max. Um, I think a book about movies that 
mentioned the Road Warrior as a comparison to Kurosawa is like one of the first times I remember hearing about him. Really? In like my distant past. That's interesting. That was like 10 years ago. Huh. But I was like, oh, I don't know who that guy is. I don't yeah. really know what that movie is. But like, I for some reason took note of that. And I like mm-hmm. looked at that and I was like, oh, interesting. And <laughs> then now here I am. And I know slightly more about some of those things. I guess that's something I should... I should check my privilege. I guess I did kind of grow up in a house of film nerds, so like I always I knew who Kurosawa yeah, was. Definitely <laughs> did not. Like, That's funny. I had my dad trying to get me to watch this movie for years. He's like, please, please. I've seen the opening please. bit of it a few times. Yeah. There you go. Um, I, I'm getting there, kind of. You're you know. getting there. You're doing it. Um, obviously, the movie is a notable inspiration for filmmakers all over the world, from like Quentin Tarantino to Ramesh Sippy, which is just side note, basically remade Seven Samurai um, as like a Bollywood film, and it apparently is credited with making Bollywood what it is and completely revolutionizing uh, the, the Indian film industry entirely it was a remake of Seven Samurai. Nice. Um, so it, it, it's had so a very broad success. Seven Samurai in just makes cinema. Seven Samurai is the way we have, is why we have movies. Unless you're that third version of Magnificent Seven from a few years ago, which, which wasn't good. It <laughs> wasn't very good. Which is uh, sad. Wow. It had a handful of good people in it. That's true. It had um, potential. It's not a good movie, though. Okay. I kind of want to watch the original one, though. Yeah, I, I mean, I will. I guess this is, yeah, this is a good point. No, but the original movie titled The Magnificent Seven made as a Western film. LOL. I wish I could be more into Westerns, but I'm just like, Me I watch too. a Western, I'm like, I want to watch a Samurai movie. I'm trying to think <laughs> the last time that I watched, like, a legit Western. Uh, so, I, I, know, I can't think of any. Oh, well. Two days. I want to watch track. Tombstone. Me too. Um, I was told to watch that. Yeah, yeah, I'll watch it. I'll do because it. Because it's got all the boys in it. I think we only have, like, one or two Western films on this list. Yeah. Maybe only one. I don't remember. We have the good, the bad, and the ugly. You can't keep them um, straight. Okay, I, what, la- one last sentence I have on here is, it probably isn't hyperbole to say that we can thank Seven Samurai for movies as we know them today. It definitely isn't to say we owe our modern conception of film to Chris Hall. Boom. Yeah. Seven Samurai was the third highest grossing film of the year, putting it just over Godzilla, which also came out this year. 9.6 million huh. ticket sales, equivalent to about $170 million today, taking from a budget of 125 million yen, which is like 1 million US dollars, or, or 10.6 million today. Dang. Um, it earned... 268 million, which is like 222.25 million today. So it had some pretty good returns. It mm-hmm. more than doubled its budget. Um, so that's cool. Good job. Now all I have is the further watching. So if you want to watch Kurosawa's really good films, um, I, I highly recommend One Wonderful Sunday from 1946, mm. uh, which is like a neorealist Gendai Geki modern film uh, about this couple who like don't have a lot of money. And so they just, like, try to do whatever they can to have their, like, date day on Sunday walking around Tokyo. And it's very cute. Um, Drunken Angel is one where Toshiro Mifune is, like, getting involved in the, to the Yakuza. That one's Gendai Geki. Stray Dog is, like, a classic noir film um, from 1949, Gendai Geki. Rashomon, which we already talked about. Ikiru is probably the thing. Ikiru. It's uh, the guy who plays Kanbei. Um, Takashi Shimura is like this lead and it's I think I talked about it when we did the um, It's a Wonderful Life episode because it's yes. it's just like if that were better um, <laughs> <Very good>. The <laughs> Hidden Fortress that one. It's good the, uh, the Hidden Fortress from 1958 is a Jedi Geki samurai film that is the inspiration for Star Wars um, Yojimbo 1961 Jedi Geki is the inspiration for Fistful of Dollars Redbeard is really cool I think it's kind of technically a Jedi Geki but it's a bit more modern it's like early 1900s um, which is about like doctors in a thing. I don't know how to explain it. It's good, and it's also three hours, so, you know, whatever. Durzu Azala is a film that is in Russian that takes place in Russia that is based off of a book that Kurosawa used to be obsessed with. It came out in 1975 and was made in the Soviet Union with some Soviet people, and it's good somehow, and it's awesome, and I love it also. It's, mm. it's like the ultimate bromance. It's, <laughs> a, it's, an, it's an intercultural bromance for the ages, and I highly recommend it with everything in me because the cinematography is fucking gorgeous. Uh, Ran is like one of the really big ones from 85. Um, it's a big, big, important samurai movie. Yeah. And then the last film I have of his that might be worth watching is Madadeo from 1993. It's the last film he ever made. And I don't know. It's cute. It doesn't get a lot of attention. I think it's cute and you should watch it. Um, okay, sorry. Hmm. Cool. But here is my list of excellent Jidai Geki films that are not Kurosawa related. If you found this interesting at all and wanted to watch more, the Musashi Miyamoto trilogy, which I already talked about earlier by Inagaki. Yeah is good. Harakiri is an anti-samurai film, which I think we've watched. Uh, and it's good. It's from 62. I just watched The Life of Oharu by Kenji Mizuguchi, and it's a very feminist movie <laughs> from 1952, 
really dig into Kenji Mizuguchi if you want to, because like, man, very, very feminist in a very good way. Um, and then another popular one is The Sword of Doom from 1966 by Kihachi Okamoto. And there we are. There we have it. There's the things. You, you know what my favorite samurai movie is? What? Um, the Last Samurai. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wait, I like that movie so much, though. I love that movie. Just, uh, I just tried to think of the most like horrible thing that I would say. I but it's good though. Need to rewatch that movie. I don't know if that movie is like considered a blight on everything. I'm not really sure. Isn't it Tom I don't Bruce? think it might generally be. even considered a samurai. Like, I, know, I don't think it's, it's I know, considered. It's like, a samurai, but <gasps> I know. I, I was actually the thing that I thought before that I was gonna say a movie that I haven't actually seen, but I want to see. I was gonna say Le Samurai. Le Samurai. I do um, kind of want to see that. I really want to see that. Like, yeah. Cool. Um. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. I feel like. From what I've heard of the last summer, I haven't seen it because it seems like it's a very white savior yeah, kind of that's thing, what I which see is really as. gross. Looking back on it now, I'm like, that is totally what it is. <laughs> oh, I don't really? know. It's really guess. rough. I don't I know. I feel like it's like it comes in and, he, but he's like, it's about the culture. Like he comes in as this right. white man to it or whatever, and he's like, oh, what is this? This yeah. is weird. And then it's like a deep, a yeah. deeply embedded respect right. and honoring towards the culture. It's, it's like, but it's white saviory without. Spoilers without actually being the savior. <laughs> okay, well that's okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, like better. I remember really enjoying yeah, it. Yeah, I did like it when I saw it, but it was a long time ago, and I would like to revisit it. It was cool. For it was reasons. well done. I'll it's very it pretty. Guys, if you want. Yeah, it's very got pretty. Tom Cruise Good and Ken music. Watanabe in it. And you love Watanabe, Ken. Yeah, it's got that I don't know usual good Hans Zimmer score in it. It's a my level of a samurai movie. Yeah. I'll say it that way. <laughs> I liked it. It it was very accessible, and, and mm-hmm. it has an American lead in. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. That's I don't know. I mean, I'm accessible, cool, American lead. I don't care. But yes. yeah, that's cool. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I was not meaning to actually talk about that. No, that's no, cool. No, I that's feel like <laughs> that's what people will relate to because not as many people have watched this. Right. Like that, yeah, other people will know actually, that. Yeah. Like that's a movie that like people we know who are just, for lack of a better word, normies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> have seen. Normies. So. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, okay. If, you, if you're coming from something like that and you're wanting something that is easier to get into that is a samurai film this is probably not it like this is not the easiest thing to dive into for a samurai film yeah. like it's it's, it's so fun long. but it's it's long yeah. um i definitely think if you're wanting to get more into samurai films or something but you want something that's very accessible then definitely watch yojimbo yojimbo is insanely light um <laughs> but has just much more in my opinion much more solid um like action it it's a lot easier to follow it's very short Gotcha. Uh, is a good time. It's also widescreen because it what comes in that? the 60s. Nice. Kurosawa took forever to get to, fi- to color film. <laughs> His first color film was in 1970. Which is he said, interesting. Slow mo. He was, I guess he just, he didn't want to do it until he went, until he could go all in, I think. And Fair. he also saw it as, I guess that's some, that rant that I had, where, like, it's a, creative choice whether you're doing black and white or color the Mm. default shouldn't just be color yeah um and so yeah his color films are crazy because once he gets into color he just makes the most extreme use of color that like you could see it's bonkers (laughs) the stuff that he does with color once he gets into it in the 70s anyway i skipped over all my stuff about like historical context of the samurai population and different tropes that are broken by (laughs) samurai in this movie and different things that that means because (laughs) It's just a lot of information. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'll post, maybe I'll, I'll post this, uh, this thing on Letterboxd if you guys, anybody <laughs> listening is interested. Um, but anyway, there's, some, there's definitely obviously more to get into with Seven Samurai, which is why I'm now writing my thesis on it. But it's, okay. uh, you know, that's what I got. I'm done. Woo! Talk the words. And it actually comes in at not even almost our longest episode. An so hour and 15? I rushed my way through this wow. shit. I am proud of you. Because <laughs> everybody's going to be mad still. at me. I just didn't uh, want to sit here for four hours. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want it to be longer than the I movie. thought it was good. Yeah. There was a little bit of me that was like, maybe I should make it. It would be kind of funny if this movie, if this episode <laughs> is longer than the movie. But, oh but it, the only way that would have happened is it would have required multiple people who were very into the movie, right. would, which would mean it would require one other person other than me. <laughs> <laughs> that was into the movie. Uh, like, I appreciate it. <laughs> I was like, I know that this is good and quality. Yeah. And y'all are gonna hate me for this, but deep down I was kind of just like, mm. 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 that's fair. That's yeah. fair. I'll be honest. That's how I felt the first time I watched the movie. This is this is, this is my confession corner. When I watched yeah. the movie the first time, I was like, I mean, yeah, it's got some good stuff, and 
because I've never had a problem with length in movies. I was like, I mean, I could see, you know, it's fine. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I watched it on an airplane ride when I was going <laughs> entirely across the country Ugh, from one no. end to the other. Jeez. And the movie was longer than that plane ride. It destroys me. Like every time someone's like, I watched such and such quality movie for the first time on an airplane. And I'm just like, no. I know. Wait. Well, I had I had noise canceling headphones, and it was downloaded on my iPad, and still. using the criteria and stuff, and I watched wow. bits on it, but it still wasn't great. It, it was not the best like thing to watch. Rough. It wasn't great, uh, and I was walking through the airport carrying it because the movie wasn't done yet, <laughs> and I didn't want to like pause. Finish. So I yeah, it was it was a weird time, and I was like, you know what, it's fine. Like it it does some you know it's a samurai movie, and that's cool, but yeah. it it doesn't have like the the depth or intrigue, it didn't give me the, like, emotional gut punch that Rashomon did or mm. whatever. Yeah. Several of his other films had, like, these gut punch things to them. Yeah. Um, and this isn't really going for that. Right? And so it's, it's the kind of movie that, like, has a lot to it but also could easily pass you by. Like, mm. you, could, you could watch it and it could just be like, yeah, that was okay. Right. You know? Like, yeah, it's a little bit long, but yeah, it's fine. Um, but yeah, like, the more that I've just delved into Kurosawa and studied things, the more I'm interested in Seven Samurai as a Kurosawa film, mm -hmm. maybe more than just as a film itself, you know? Yeah. It's just cooler in context, I think. Um, yeah, that's cool. Heck yeah. So I don't know where you guys where you guys put this film for you. Oh, I, sh I forgot to I forgot to rate it. Or I forgot to put it on my like stars or? or any other things. Yeah. Ranking. And I gave it four stars because I know it was really good, but I just didn't personally like love that's sitting fair. there. Mm -hmm. Opinions are important, and I don't really like the idea of the objectivity of film that a lot of people act like exists like there are things that are objectively bad and there are things that are maybe objectively not bad right but whether or not it's the best movie ever made or just kind of fine is whatever you know yeah it just is what it is it is what it is it's me yeah i don't know the idea of like somebody trying to make a case for why grand illusion is a better film than rear window is like <laughs> i don't I don't know what you're talking about because ultimately they're just very different things. Like you can't really compare them. I don't know. It's art, whatever. Yes. Art. 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 What do you think, Gunter? Uh, I gave it four and a half. I gave it four and a half stars again. Yeah. Uh, I just updated my ranking list and I've got it. It didn't update. Uh, at number seven. That's cool. Hell yeah. That is including our next film, which I have already watched. Ah, yeah, I have, I have that one on here, but I will not mention where my ranking is for it. <laughs> Ooh la la! Oh. Hmm. More to come. Obviously, I gave this movie five stars. I don't know if you thought I was going to do anything different. It was the third <gasps> time I've watched it in the last six months. If you were like, I'm writing my thesis on it, but I gave it three stars, I would have slapped you. It would have been really funny. I would have been like, no. My thesis um, is well. Seven Samurai is just kind of an okay movie. <laughs> it's fine. Like, I'd rather talk about Kurosawa as a whole than talk about Seven Samurai specifically, but it's a bachelor's thesis. I've only got 20 pages. I can't just talk about Kurosawa as a whole. That's not going <laughs> to pass me. Um, so, yeah. Yeet. But also, here's something wacky. It's not the top ranked film on this list for me. What's your top ranked? Tokyo Story still. <laughs> no! <laughs> and with that, we're going to end this. Good night, everybody. We have to go have a serious conversation. Wait, 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 okay, uh, go. I mean, I'm right about it. Get, yes. Um, <laughs> you are. You can find some nonsense about our stuff at movieoverloadpod.com. Woo! There yeah. you can find links to all of our socials. There's so many things you can overload check out on there. What? There's so many things you can check out on their website. There are many things you can find. At Movie Overload Just Pod on Instagram, website. at Movie Overload underscore yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Some hate mail. Come to Twitter to find me sometimes accidentally reply to political things because I am accidentally signed into the Movie Overload Oops. tweet. Oops. And then I have to delete a tweet. Yeah. Womp, womp. Come, come join for that. Oh, 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 oh. Follow us for that. And also um, leave us reviews on things. Please. Please. Please good, do it. Like generally good ones, but if they're like a little weird or spicy, we'll accept those too. Do something real spicy. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's all I got. That's cool. Oh, also, um, Ryan Gosling fucks. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. That's true. All right. Who would, who would you cast in Seven Samurai? Oh, my gosh. But here's the caveat. You can't whitewash the cast. Tom oh. Cruise oh. and... <laughs> that's I feel it. like Ethan Hawke has to be there. Ethan Hawke and Christian Bale. He was in that <laughs> Magnificent Seven. Oh, yeah. Dang it. That's why. Yeah. That's it. That's uh, I want uh, Adam Sandler. Uh, <laughs> Owen Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Owen Wilson. Jeez. <laughs> Jose Hachi. <laughs> Yes. If we could get Orson Welles to be Kanbei too, that would be cool. Whoa. He's bringing back. Um, I want Humphrey Bogart to be that farmer Oof. guy who lost his wife. 
Yeah, oh, he has he has a great look for that. Yeah, it'd be a good time. Um, Cary Grant would make a really good old man. You know, the old man. He would be that. The guy. old man. The yeah. old man. Remember the old man? I do. Uh, he, the old, the old man's kind of cool. All right, white, whitewashed it is. Well, oh, thanks. All right. Hunter All right. in the corner. As we tend to do the thing at the end of the pod, we say things that we say to end an episode. <laughs> and that thing is a quote. And that quote is delivered by the boy, Hunter. <laughs> your boy. You look so done right now. <laughs> just tired. He loves my Sorry. introduction. Yeah, no, you're good. I'm just waiting for you to be done. And I'm just waiting <laughs> for you to find one. That's too late. I already did it. Fuck. Oh. Okay, as we say at the end of the episode, when it ends. <laughs> This is the nature of war. By protecting others, you save yourselves. If you only think of yourself, you will only destroy yourself. It's Deep. definitely... Uh, that sounds like a toxic victim different, mindset. Different. Uh, or toxic martyrdom. No! It's collectivism. <laughs> yeah! Which is Very good, I think, Asian. in my opinion. <laughs> I'm much more into the collectivist like, mindset than the individualist yeah, mindset yeah, because yeah, yeah. things... No, I was just talking about in therapy this morning <laughs> when how, like... In very religious organizations and churches, it's like martyrdom is praised. And if you focus yeah. on yourself, you're selfish. But, like, you actually right. have to. Yeah. But that's a different topic. That's mental right. health. Anyway, there, good yeah. job. There's, there's, there's an nuance. aspect to which this movie also advocates for self-care while advocating for collectivism. Right. Yeah. Which is interesting. Right. It's, it, yeah. Because, like, in the scene, it makes sense. Right. Like, it, yeah. It's, uh, it's yeah. context sensitive. Like, good there's quote, that bit where quote. Heihachi goes over to Rikichi and he's like, are you okay? Like, hey, it's, it doesn't help for you if you're not going to open up about your feelings. Like, you, you know, we could share this burden together. I feel like it's cool. <laughs> anyway. And definitely yeah. not something that existed at the time. Right. All yeah. right. Thanks. Anywho. Wait, 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 wait. I have a question. <gasps> mm. Um, Do we know anything about the, the anime called Seven Samurai? Oh. Isn't that what it's called? Uh, isn't it Samurai is it Seven? Samurai Seven? Is, it about, is it about this? It's all, yeah, it's based off of this. He has writing. They gave him, like, cre- writing credit or something on it or something. Whoa. I don't know. It was weird. But, yeah. I, I wonder <laughs> if it's any good. Go find uh, it. Not. It looks weird. Know. It looks very anime. And it's definitely anime. weird. Uh, anyway, I don't know why I talked about that. Anyway, okay. Thank you. This is the Peace out, mother truckers. Fuck you. <laughs>